This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Uh, this week we have Wendy Ju, who is one of our own, uh, sort of in the sense that she's not part of our department in CS. She's actually a graduate student uh, who's finishing her dissertation in the design division of mechanical engineering, uh, but we work closely with them and uh, her thesis has really crossed that boundary between thinking about design from a sort of point of view of the things you, out, you encounter in the world and thinking about design from the computation and the, the interaction side. Um, and she'll be describing implicit interactions. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me OK? OK. So as Terry said, this topic, uh, the design of implicit interactions, is work that I'm doing for my dissertation. It's still work in progress. So um, you know, actually, every time I kind of come to this, I have different uh, outlooks on things like that. And so I'm really interested to get your feedback at, at the end of this talk. Um, I am an emissary from the Center for Design Research, which is not far away. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually located near term in engineering. Um, but you know, it's the Center for Design Research. And sometimes people ask, like, what does that mean, design research? You know, design is a practice. What's the research part of that? So just to kind of give a brief overview, which I think will help frame the stuff that you're going to see about my research, um, I kind of have this model where design is the kind of work that we're doing design is like a tree. And you know, on the, on the branches and the leaves, you kind of have this divergence where people are designing all sorts of different things. And at the CDR, just the CDR, there are people who are working on robots, there are people working on collaborative workspaces, people who are working on cars, you know. Um, and so, you know, these, these kind of a nice, really huge branching factor. But the thing that brings commonality to people who are working on these diverse things is not that we're all mechanical engineering and the laws of physics apply, <laughs> but that we're all designers. And so there are kind of core um, parts of practice that we share in what we're doing. So um, practices like need finding, sketching, prototyping, critique, and demonstration, in which uh, you'll find that, that most design, like any design discipline, any dis discipline that calls itself some sort of design discipline has some version of these things. Underground with this kind of design tree is, are these values. Um, and people always say, oh, designers value aesthetics, or designers believe in creativity. But actually, I think that like the applications of design, the values for designers also diverge widely. There are designers who kind of believe very heavily in inform informalisms, and you know, that things have to be very structured, and there's a way. And there are people who believe very strongly in the informal. And for anybody to tell you that this is the design way, it's you know, not actually right, but it is actually an important aspect of design to have these values and to uh, incorporate those values into your practice and bring that to your application. And so that's why you hear people talking about that. Um, earlier this year, we had John Zimmerman coming in and talking about uh, the value of identity construction and how that kind of pervades. And that's an example of this sort of thing. So um, the research I do is out here in the leaves, uh, working specifically on uh, interactive product design. Um, and kind of in the space that most of you would recognize as ubiquitous computing. So I think the basic you know, thing that all people working in Ubicomp would agree on is that soon computation will be like electricity, which is to say it will be cheap and ubiquitous, it will be everywhere, and it's all incredibly plastic that will take on all these forms. So if you think about the stuff that you use in your house that has electricity in it, you, know, you have a television or a blender or a light bulb, if these things have very little formal commonality or functional commonality, but they all use kind of the similar resource. Um, and the, the really important question like nowadays is not like how do you do stuff with electricity, because electricity is really well understood, but what will we do with it? So it turns into a design problem. And we're really looking at a period in time when we're looking at the similar situation in computation, that someday we'll be able to have you know, the ability to do computation and sensing and actuation and all sorts of products, but what we're going to do with it is a big question. Like, what are the problems we're trying to solve? And, you know, what are the constraints that 
we'll deal with there. So it's an opportunity. Uh, it's not a problem domain the way something like usability is, but uh, it's, it's an opportunity to use these kind of things that we don't, we don't actually know how to use yet. So one of the things that's an issue with this opportunity is that we don't actually bring a lot of experience to bear on being able to design things that are so plastic. Um, so traditional human-computer interaction works differently than the way that you normally think of uh, how you'd want to interact with, with kind of everywhere computers. So I'd say the main paradigm behind traditional computing is this kind of model that I'm representing in this picture where, you're, where the yeah. user is really yeah. focused on doing, getting the computer to do things uh, for them and, and you know, they're working on a single task. And, and in fact, this model is actually starting to die away even in traditional desktop computing. Uh, that actually accounts for a lot of the really interesting research and interruptions where people aren't uh, devoted to a single task, that their attention is divided among multiple things and that that's actually difficult to manage. We actually find that those are the challenging things because our traditional models of interactions and paradigms don't fit that nicely. Uh, and so a lot of people have recognized this kind of problem of kind of moving beyond explicit interaction. And a lot of times they, they kind of bring up variations of what I call uh, Uvacomp dystopia, um, where they talk about you know, how everything can go awry if you have all these things that have computers around your household and, and you need to control them all and run around and push all their buttons or talk to them all. Um, and what's more, they'll be talking back at you, beeping and speaking, and like, you know, the poor user will just be totally flummoxed. Um, so, so, you know, like there, there are a number of people who are kind of talking about this. And at this, you know, at the, at the start of this field of ubiquitous computing, the people who are kind of calling out this is a field talked about, followed up their initial um, discussion of a computer for the 21st century with this kind of discussion of the need for calm computing because Everyone who's interested in taking advantage of these opportunities realizes that a really important thing to solve with this kind of pushing computers into everything is how to figure out how to do interactions so that you're not left with this ubiquitous dystopia. So just to continue with this motivation a little bit, um, Don Norman has a book coming out called The Design of Future Things. And he frames this um, issue really nicely. I think a lot of people have put it different ways, why it's bad, why it's good. But Don says the so-called intelligent systems have become too smug. As machines start to take over, more and more they have, have to become socialized. They need to improve the way they communicate and interact and to recognize their limitations. Only then can they become truly useful. So this is a really interesting statement because it says that the big challenge isn't like some sort of technology that we need to do, some uh, way of doing inference with you know, 15 sensors or 100 sensors. But the, the big challenge lies on the human side, or like how do you communicate things to the human um, about what is possible and also what is not possible. And so uh, a lot of people have been interested in this kind of word, implicit interaction. It's been thrown about the kind of ubiquitous computing space a lot, but there's not a lot of understanding of, of how you design implicit interaction and what specifically makes something implicit exactly. <laughs> and so uh, for my dissertation, I'm actually uh, setting out first to just do a better job of kind of defining what implicit interactions are so that we can actually analyze things and then have given, having some sort of framework to understand implicit interactions with, um, thinking about how we then design them um, intentionally as opposed to kind of saying like, oh, this kind of works. Uh, but to really be able to say like, this is the effect we're going for and to actually have ways of getting there. So uh, the first part is uh, about understanding implicit interactions. And then I'll talk a little bit about a few projects I'm doing to apply the framework that I've developed, I'm showing you here. So I'm going to start showing you some um, cool things in this kind of space of implicit interaction. I actually, um, I think the space is actually quite large, but if you just look at the people who explicitly call their work implicit interaction work, it, it, it dies down a little bit. Uh, but some of the earliest kind of mentors in implicit interaction started really early. Um, there's some the work that um, Tom Moran and, and the uh, Xerox, Ben Xerox Park um, group did on interactive whiteboards talked about how um, when people write things down on a whiteboard, that there's some implicit structure um, to the way that they write things. That there are kind of these lists and groups. Um, and they were really interested in having the computer recognize those things and do the right thing. Um, and so you know, that's like kind of one of the first mentions of, kind of implicit interaction in this space. Around the same time, Albert Schmidt, who uh, is now at the University of Lancaster, I believe, um, wrote this paper called Implicit Human-Computer Interaction Through Context. And this kind of uh, speaks a little bit of how implicit interactions touch on this context to where computing. 
Um, but he talks about uh, one example of the sort of things that he was saying that you could do with implicit interactions, that you could have a tie that has a microphone that could tell when people are talking or if there's ambient noise, and use that to kind of guess what the uh, situation that the user is in is, and use that information to kind of infer whether it's a good time to interrupt them or not, or to offer different services, whether your cell phone should ring. Um, so there's kind of this focus on, um, you know, it wasn't explicitly called out, but on managing the, the user's attentional resource because they can't pay attention to so many things at the same time, and using context as a way to kind of get at what those attentional resources might be. A little bit more recently, um, I'm oh, sorry, so this is another kind of early work in uh, the implicit interaction, this, this thing on the right, the um, touch trackball and touch mouse that Ken Hinckley and Mike Sinclair did um, at Microsoft Research. And they were talking about how when you use a mouse, um, when you're not pushing the buttons and you're not pushing the mouse around, you still do things where you rest your hands in different positions depending on what you're doing. And if you can recognize that by using capacitive sensing in the mouse, you can help anticipate what the user is doing um, and also um, kind of be prepared to like scroll before you before the user asks to scroll and things like that. So kind of like a, a pre-caching of activity. Um, newer versions of that kind of thing where you're, you're trying to monitor people's activities so that you can help them, assist them with, with the things that they're trying to do is this uh, work that was done uh, at the Victoria Institute where they're having people wear uh, basically RFIDs on their hands and then having readers all over the place where so that uh, you can tell when someone's walking through a door or when they um, pick up certain objects. And like by building a profile of what they're doing, you can try to guess you know, whether they need assistance or whether they can be interrupted or um, get help. Still another example, a nice kind of very common example is kind of location awareness. Um, so this uh, is a work that was done by Yang Lee and Jason Hong and James Landay, uh, published at WIST two years ago, three years ago. Um, called Topiary, and it was a toolkit for um, for prototyping location enhanced applications. But one of the things they talk about is how location can be used as an implicit input, so that uh, you don't have to ask someone. You know, when you pull up a map, you can actually put them in the center and not ask them to input their location. So a lot of things kind of build on that kind of idea of understanding something about the user situation. And then finally, in the kind of space of displays, there's this kind of talking about. Uh, implicit um, interactions as a way of um, helping to steer people's attention in, in ways that are kind of, I feel sort of good and bad. So the, the, this first um, application here on the left is uh, Paul Dietz um, and other folks uh, who, who have been working on this idea of persuasive displays. And they have this idea that when you're walking through a store that the displays could try to draw your attention to the fact that there are these shoes that you might buy or, you know, something that's in your size or uh, for you. And so this, um, they're basically trying to um, proactively suggest things that you would like. Um, and they, so they have these spotlights that show up and they use multiple projectors to kind of direct your attention. Um, also in the space of displays, a little bit kind of less specially distributed, but also less, you know, problematic from a consumerism point of view. Uh, was this nice work done by David Vogel and Robin Balakrishnan um, in, in investigating public ambient displays. And they talk about how you really kind of have a different interaction with a wall size display if you're far away uh, versus when you're up close. So that distance basically forms an implicit cue about the sort of interaction that you'd like to have. And so they explored um, using a, a tracking system to tell where people are and then like change the display as people walk closer and further and explored whether you could uh, track multiple users to kind of create it so that someone can look at private information up close but have that information hidden from people who are away. So here's this like really uh, eclectic collection of different things that call themselves implicit. And I think that we all kind of see that there's some aspect of it. The user isn't totally aware what, of what's going on. Definitely they're not pushing any buttons to make things happen. Um, but aside from that, and, and, and what makes that, like, is it just the lack of buttons or the use of sensors that makes things implicit? I think is a little unclear just from, like, a reading of the things that call themselves explicit in the human-computer interactions literature. Um, Albert Schmidt, actually, in his, his uh, paper, which I called out earlier, talks about how when you're observing communication between people, you can see that there's a lot of things that happen implicitly, that there's uh, information that 
is exploited, that's not kind of said directly verbally between one person and the other, and that, that, that robustness, having multiple channels of uh, additional and sometimes redundant information um, with gestures and body language and voice can actually help really ameliorate human, um, human interaction and that we'd want something similar for human computer interaction. But no one's really gone a step further in saying like how do we really draw like on the knowledge of how implicit interactions happen in the human-human interaction space and bring them to human-machine interaction. There's just a desire to have something that is uh, similar. So here are some examples of everyday implicit interactions in human-human uh, communication. So when I'm walking down the hall and I'm going up to Terry's office and I wonder if he's in there, I can actually tell to a surprising degree whether he's going to be available for me to talk to based on the state of his door. Um, if his door is closed, he's probably not there. And if he is there, we should pretend like he's not there. Uh, if it's just a little bit open, I might knock if it's really important, but I might also just pass on by if it was just to see, you know, how things are. And if his door is wide open, then, and, you know, I, I might look in and see if he's engaged typing and then interrupt. I uh, said so that the state of the door is a way of kind of that Terry has communicated with me about uh, his availability, but it's not something that he's done explicitly to kind of signal that, but it has the effect of signaling things to me. Um, another thing that we do in every day is kind of think, if you think about the way we interact with people at a diner. Um, if I'm talking to a friend across the table and I've run out of coffee, I've drunk all my coffee, I can actually move the coffee cup to the edge of the table and that forms an implicit request for more coffee. So, you know, I could flag down the waitress and say like, hey, I'm out of coffee, but this makes it so that you know, it doesn't have to be synchronous and this person can more easily see that I'm out of coffee and fill it up. Um, similarly, if she should come by before my coffee is totally done, she can offer coffee not by saying like, do you want more coffee, but you know, just tilting the craft at me and I might then offer my coffee cup. And the last example I'll use of kind of everyday implicit interactions is when you're kind of standing around with a group of people and one of you has to go when there's still a conversation on. Like, Usually people don't interrupt unless there's something important to say before you leave. You might just start backing away. Um, but people don't usually just like turn around and take off. They do back away slowly. And what this affords is the fact that people can see that you're going to go by the fact that you're going, but you go slowly enough that if there's some sort of override, like if there's something that you want to tell someone before they leave, um, that you're able to communicate that. So. One of the things I'm looking at is whether we can have human computer interactions do these things, signal to people what is possible and what's available um, when, without actually having to say so, um, offer to provide assistance, assistance if there's assistance to be had, and also recognize cues that are requesting assistance without kind of having to have someone go and press a button that says, I need help. Uh, and finally, like kind of uh, giving off cues to kind of show what's about to happen to help people kind of uh, know that they're, they're trying to stop something before it happens or, you know, that just to set up expectations so they can kind of just make their plans accordingly. So the kind of work I've been doing is grounded in uh, looking at how humans and humans interact. And, and to do this, we could go to social science literature. Um, on the kind of more familiar, on the side of things that are more familiar to product designers is kind of theories of, of affordances and how uh, products how uh, people look at products and are able to see what is possible with them. Um, when Gibson initially, uh, who's a, he, Gibson is a perceptual psychologist, he had this idea that when people look at the world, they don't just look and see things like a frame buffer, but what they see are, they pick up cues about what is possible and their, um, their attention focuses on things that, where there are uh, affordances or potential for action or there are properties that are kind of, so, um, support different kinds of action. Um, this work was kind of adapted later on. Uh, sometime by the time Norm, uh, Don Norman took on the role of affordances, it, uh, affordances had this kind of slightly different tone where it was no longer an inherent physical property of the object, but in fact something that was kind of established through perception. Like you, affordance was just what you could see you could do. And if there was something secretly uh, possible that you couldn't see that sort of doesn't suggest itself as an affordance. Uh, recent research by, I think his name is James Rizzo, actually has explored the way that it goes beyond that. It's not just that affordances are perceptual, they're socially constructed. You don't actually even see that something is possible until the, you have some sort of interaction that shows you that thing, thing is possible. So they've done these really interesting work, uh, cognitive science work, 
uh, with babies, showing them things that have like holes and things where you can stick balls in. And like babies don't really stick the balls in until they see one person do it, but you only have to do it once and then they're sticking in. So it means that the, this kind of idea of affordance that we have, uh, we think it sort of might be inherent or might just be perceptual is actually constructed socially. And so if you kind of bring that to um, thinking about when we're designing machines, we can think a little bit about how the machines can behave socially to indicate what is possible for them to do. Um, Herb Clark, who's here at Stanford, has done some just you know basic work in talking about how people um, have performed joint action using communication. And that's also been a really important aspect of this understanding this work. Uh, he talks specifically about how two people who are interacting understand what things are being talked about and what the joint goals are. And so that will kind of come up again. Um, and I, I'm going to jump ahead and talk a little bit about Cliff Ness and Byron Reeves, who talked a lot about how you know, people treat computers like they are other people. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons why I really want to call this out, even though this is work that's familiar to most people, is that I think a lot of people are tied to this idea that this has something to do with the fact that people think uh, view things anthropomorphically, that they think the computer is another person. And it's really important to understand that in Nass and Reeves' work, they never assert that anthropomorphism is a, is a uh, factor. They basically say that people have this way of behaving socially in response to the world. And so if something interacts with them, they do that. And you know, they have studies that show that people who are like PhDs in computer science will respond more socially to computers than uh, lay users, which suggests that uh, kind of a deep understanding of the lack of personhood isn't the reason uh, why people have a social response. So it's really important to my work because the sort of things that we're designing with these interactive products don't necessarily have kind of anthropomorphic features, but once they start communicating, we'll, have the fun we'll be using the functions of communication. So one last work in kind of realm of social science, and this is work done by Michael Argyle and how people interact with bodily communication. Um, and he uses this sort of uh, traditional communications model of having a sender encoding a message that's received by the receiver, but talks about how in bodily communications, a lot of times the two people may not be perfectly aware of what's going on. So, um, um, he talks about how what we normally think of tr traditional communication uh, occur when both the sender and receiver are aware. That there's some sort of, so that's kind of verbal communication, communication, but also includes things like explicit gestures, for example, pointing, and things that are emblematic, uh, have um, pre-ascribed meanings. He actually kind of points out there's this kind of non-verbal communication, which happens when the sender is mostly unaware, but the receiver is aware. So that's like, um, if I look at you and, um, you can see that I have orange hair. Or I'm wearing my, you know, my kind of professorial brown jacket, and that these things actually are read by you to mean certain things. Where if I kind of wiggle around a lot, and it seems like I'm nervous and don't have control of it. Um, these things still kind of color your interpretation of what's going on as the receivers. Um, also, in the realm of nonverbal communication, are things where the sender is totally unaware, and the receiver is in fact unaware. It, not explicitly aware, but things are having effects. So um, things like pupil, pupil dilation, gaze shifts, and other nonverbal signals, where if you ask someone afterwards where they look, you know, where their pupils dilated, they won't know, but they'll actually be able to tell if people are excited or not excited, and they won't know why. This is actually kind of some of the premise of Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Um, and then he includes here for the scientists situations where um, people are trained to recognize things that are normally not noticed. Um, so the sender is aware because they're trained in social, uh, spatial behavior that they're giving off certain cues. So a lot of times actors and actresses will do that um, to kind of uh, communicate things. And you don't know why you feel a certain way about that character, but it's because the actor's trained to give things off that go beyond the verbal communication. Um, and then situations where you, um, the sender is unaware, but the receiver is aware <coughs> because maybe the receiver is a scientist who's uh, trained in the interpretation of, for example, bodily posture. So, this is a really useful way of kind of thinking about how human, uh, human uh, implicit interactions can occur. And so if we actually map this kind of idea of having human-human interactions with the sender and receiver, but kind of replace senders and receiver um, with an interactive system, um, we have the situation where we, um, we have a sender, and there's kind of, this is a situation where you have input. We're sending something a re uh, receiver, and that's a reactive system where the system is reacting to something the center is doing. 
Um, our systems were proactive, where the cent um, I drew this arrow the wrong way, but you have a, the sender is an interactive system and it's received by the person. So if we kind of take this a little further, all of the um, projects that we looked at had these two features that was kind of hard to pick out, um, which is that um, my technology issues. On one hand, there's this management in, atten in uh, implicit interactions of attentional demand. And a lot of the things that kind of the focus was on, on the user not having to focus on doing something or knowing that something is going to happen. Um, so uh, there's this kind of interesting thing that you're playing with when you're trying to design implicit interaction, which is controlling the, the whether uh, interactions occur in the attentional foreground or the background. However, there's this other important dimension, which is initiative, and whether it's the user or it was the person or the system that would be doing the um, the sending or receiving. Um, and so, in some of the other systems, even though things are in people's uh, perceptual foreground, so for example, in the case of displays. Um, because it's the display that's actually taking action and sending information, it's not the user who's kind of explicitly trying to make things happen. And so that, too, is implicit. Um, and so that kind of gives us this framework um, where we kind of take Michael Argyle's understanding what nonverbal communication is and map it onto implicit interaction. Um, we kind of have this framework where Traditional human computer actions are kind of explicit interactions occur in the space where the person is aware and the person is initiating the interaction. Um, there are also, however, these things where people are aware, but the, it's actually the system's initiating, and so it's implicit because the person is not driving it. Um, and then there's also situations where the person, where the okay. systems respond. Yeah. Lower left, lower left. Yes, oh, it should be. This should be person initiated. Sorry. I think I keep inadvertently clicking somehow. <laughs> so, um, so this should be uh, person initiate. So things on the reactive side, all person initiates, and the things on the proactive side should be system initiate. The typo. Um, but the, you know, things are in the foreground, the person is aware, and things in the background, the person is unaware. So if we look at the things that we were looking at before, they map nicely into the space. And it kind of starts to uh, explain the sort of family resemblance that these different things that call themselves implicit interactions have. So the thing that we were talking about in terms of displays, whether they're persuasive or based on proxemics, take place in the foreground but are implicit because they're proactive. Uh, systems like the touch mouse and the kind of location aware systems where the user is actually providing the input. They just don't know that they're doing it. Um, are here in the reactive background, but it's still system initiated. And then uh, si situations where the system is actually actively going out and getting information and trying to infer what's going on, um, but not necessarily bumping it up into the user's uh, perceptual foreground, um, take place in this space. And so here's a mapping of, of things that we are all familiar with uh, onto this map. So Traditional human computer actions with direct manipulations, command interfaces, even things that are tangible still take place in the kind of upper left hand quadrant. Uh, alerts, uh, things like your cell phone ringing, your alarm clock going off, um, are still implicit, though it seems ironic because you know something that's like ringing at you doesn't seem like it would be implicit, but because you didn't actually do anything to make that happen. And also it's just systems that give you directions to so any sort of educational tutorial system where the user is actually being guided by the system takes place place in this space. Um, uh, situations where you're, you're actually inputting data, but that's sort of abstracted away from you, or like the details of that are not made clear to you, take place in this reactive background space. And also the things that we talk about, uh, automation, automatic this, automatic coffee maker, this stuff that happens in this space. And then in this proactive background space is where the research and kind of ambient computing, for example, things that you don't really know as provides some low level amount of information or and even lower in terms of intentional scale, uh, agents that go out and do things for you, kind of get recommendations for you without your paying attention to them, um, are here. 
So there's, um, there is some prior work in this space of kind of um, implicit interaction frameworks, although it wasn't explicitly called out as that, um, which is uh, Bill Buxton's model of foreground and background, uh, things that take place in, in people's perf uh, peripheral, periphery or uh, in, the, in their focal area. And so he, he's the person that kind of brought the words foreground and background into this space of interaction design. Um, but one of the interesting things in, is in his like paper, main paper on integrating periphery and context, um, Buxton actually brings together both attention and intention. So he says his actual uh, little words are things that take place in the foreground are things that you pay attention to and that you do on purpose. And things that take place in the background are things that you don't pay attention to and like, you know, are done without intention. And this model is, is pretty good, but it makes it so that it doesn't really clearly account for these other areas um, uh, where you have foreground proactive or background reactive interaction. So this is a lot of you know, talking about a diagram. <laughs> let's, talk, uh, let's talk about the diagram with the actual story in place and then kind of get on to more interesting examples. So I like to use the example when I talk about post interactions of how you interact with doormen. As you're walking down the street, you see a doorman, um, and he's usually like wearing some sort of costume that's different than everyone else who's passing by. And he's usually standing out way in front of the uh, hotel door. And so the one of the point is that you can actually tell that there's a door because you see a doorman there. And the way that he's dressed draws your attention. Now as you draw closer, the doorman will often do something like put his hand on the door handle. And he usually wears like white gloves on his hand to draw attention to the fact. And he always does, they do tend to do these flourishes. So you can actually see that they're grabbing door handle when just for the, if all they were trying to do was open the door for you, just putting their hand over would do. And they might open it a little as you walk closer. And as you walk closer, it, because you see this person is trying to open the door for you, the normal thing is that people, if you notice it, to walk towards the door away from the door. And so the doormen, if you walk away from the door, tend not to open the door all the way. So you could just look at that as some sort of boarded mission. But on the other hand, you could also look at that as a conversation in which, you know, somebody actually saw that you were coming, asked if you would like to come into the building, and you declined. Um, and all this, this whole ex exchange occurred without words. So if we map that exchange onto this, um, onto this framework, you can look, think of the doorman waiting in uniform to be a basically background proactive thing. He's standing there in case he might want to enter. And as a pedestrian approaches, the doorman notices, and they put the door on the door handle dramatically. And then a person might kind of respond by avoiding eye contact and walking on an arc around the door. It's really interesting because people who are working on implicit interactions a lot of times talk about implicit interactions being subtle. And I think this is an example of how people don't really understand what's going on. Because the more subtle thing is to kind of hold the door subtly. But then when you do that, it doesn't accomplish this task, this function of communicating an offer and enabling a response. Um, so, you know, the, like we understand that putting your door on the door handle dramatically is kind of more subtle than calling out to someone, hey, do you want to come in? And, you know, requiring someone to say, like, no, thanks, you know. Um, but, but it is also not necessarily just the most subtle thing that you can do. It actually is really important that you have to get someone's attention and that it is, uh, has to fulfill this communicative function for this to work. And so this is one of those ways in which this um, framework can be pretty useful, that you can actually understand a little better what's going on. So looking a little more explicitly at the gesturing doors, another thing I'd like to do with the framework is to, to not just to understand how existing interactions work, but to, then to take that and apply it analogously to design of new interactions. So one thing that we're going to do is look at how we're working on, uh, looking at how the stuff that we understand about gesturing doors and doormen can be applied to automatic doors that basically offer to open for people. And one of the important things um, to make this work is that it's really important that people all interpret these things the same way. So there's two possibilities of what might be the case here. One thing could be that people understand doormen. At some point in time, it was explained to them how doormen work and how doormen offers. And when they offer, you walk towards them away from them. It's otherwise it's rude. Um, and, and so because they've never been taught an equivalent thing about automatic doors, it would only work if someone laid out all the rules again for automatic doors. Another possibility is that maybe the reason that doormen work uh, and is because there's some more fundamental principle about how to make offers and um, get feedback about responses um, that 
transcends the specific context. And so if you came from a culture where you've never seen a doorman before, you might still be able to figure it out. Um, and if that's the case, then, you might be, then we should be able to design automatic doors that don't require much training or prompting to get people to interpret what's going on. So just to figure out which case we have, we're trying a little experiment. Um, we're designing gesturing doors. And again, the point is to think about how understanding of the doorman's physically communicative activities can uh, inform the design of the automatic doors. And the larger question is whether we can leverage our understanding of this human-human interaction to design an interactive product. We're back to here. This is this mod, uh, diagram I've done on our framework about how doormen and uh, pedestrians interact. And so here is what we've designed as analogous door-pedestrian interaction, which is that a door waits, possibly with a sign that says it's an automatic door, something to kind of distinguish it from all the other kind of normal doors. Um, and when a pedestrian approaches, the door notices, and the door might, for example, rev its motors. That would maybe be an analogous thing to kind of say that you're about to do something or could do something. But it's important that it would do it dramatically. It's more important that it do it for the signaling purpose than to rev its motors for any actual purpose. So it might actually be fine if you just play the sound of a revving motor. Um, and that, you know, we're kind of would be interested in seeing whether people avoid the door. And that rather than build this whole thing up front and then test it out, we started out by looking at this um, with a video prototype. So we ran an exp a web-based study with 12 videos of somebody approaching a door. Um, and each video has, was slightly different. So uh, in some of the videos, in half of the videos, uh, the person is walking towards the door. and half the videos, the person is walking by the door. So the context is a little different. Um, and then in the video, the door opens at different speeds. It either opens fast or opens slow. And we did actually try at a medium speed, but it wasn't really distinguished enough, uh, a bull enough in pilot tests to get our results, so we took it out. And the final thing is the door trajectory, where we had the door end up open, um, had the door kind of pause and then open, and then had the door open and then shut. Um, and then we measured kind of how people perceived this, whether they found it welcoming or urging or reluctant. And then we had them write an open-ended response describing the experience um, which we coded. So here's an example of the videos. And this is our own Bjorn Hartman in the video. Yeah, yeah, this is, this, um, the participants, we, we all saw the same video of this actor walking up to the door. Um, and we we're basically asking them to put themselves in the actor's place and interpret what's going on. Final video. Oh, that again. <laughs> oh, great job being a dog. <laughs> This one is rather funny, but I don't know quite what's wrong with it because um, the door closes in his face. And we got really strong reactions to that one. So, you know, there's some, some strangenesses I feel like I need to explain in the, in the video. Um, one thing is that we, we had to really make a point of shooting the video so that you didn't see the actor's face. Because what we found is when we, sh when we showed people videos that showed their face, what we would get in the response is an interpretation of what the face said and not interpretation of what the experience was. Another thing is that we also like didn't show the completion of the action, either that someone walks by the door, through the door, because then people tend to that tend to strongly color how people felt about what the door did. Uh, so all the doors cut off early. So people saw this, um, and this work we we have um, partially coded. We're still working on some of the open-ended responses. I think I'm maybe double clicking. And and strange things happen. So here are our results, and we actually see um, the um, results that have two stars are um, 0.01. Um, the p equals 0.01 less, less than um, or equal to 0.01 significance, and the ones with one star are 0.05. So these are very strongly significant results that find that when the um, so, so for example uh, when the doors opens without pause, it's found to be a lot more urging than something that, that ends up closed or pauses in between. Um, 
and the door seems more reluctant to open. And so these are not totally surprising results, but the really important thing is there's a really strong cohesion in the way that people are interpreting how the door is behaving. Um, we're basically having doors do things that they don't normally do, and the idea that people will read things into that is not surprising because people read things into tea leaves. But in order to design for a situation where you're actually communicating things to people, you really need that everyone is interpreting things the same way. And that's what these results say is happening. And that doesn't mean it's going to happen in every case, but it's a, it's a promising sign. Um, so the next step in this work is to um, do the same experiment with a physical door, which we're currently working on. Uh, what you're seeing here is kind of the physical door that we have. It's a floating door, so we can actually move it around so it's the end of a hallway or down the middle of a hallway or in front of a building. So it has a wheel on the side so it can be carted around and brought into different contexts. Um, and we're actually also working on making it so you could program the door's gestures so we're actually getting the same gesture every time. So on to the second project we're doing in this space, um, which has to do with interactive whiteboards. Um, so this project is called Range, um, in part because one of the implicit cues that we're using is proximity, people's proximity to whiteboard. This is really similar to the work that was done by David Vogel and Robin Balakrishnan, but it's different in that we're not just working with displays but with the whiteboard, where you're actually performing some sort of joint action with the whiteboard. So this is kind of a shot of the board. Um, we have our two summer uh, undergraduate workers kind of modeling for us here. This is work I'm doing with Brian Lee and Dave Aker sitting back there. So the main question in this work is kind of how an understanding of the user's physical interaction patterns can inform the design of whiteboards so that the whiteboards kind of better facilitate their work. And specifically what we're interested in doing is maybe making it so that uh, things that you do all the time and on an electronic whiteboard, like switching your tools around or moving clusters of things around are a little easier um, and, and don't take away from the, the dynamics of the normal interaction. Um, part of the motivation for this comes from work that we did with on a separate project called Workspace Navigator, where we were studying how people use their workspaces um, using kind of traditional whiteboards and their computers and their workspaces. Um, and in this work, we found that when people uh, meet at whiteboards in an ad hoc manner, so this is unlike most studies, kind of we didn't force them to use the whiteboard. We're just studying when they use the whiteboard, what happens. It tends to be for a short period of time. It tends to be two or three people maximum. Um, and then they tend to have this type of interaction where one person goes up there and writes. And then they back up. And then the other person, who I sometimes call the navigator, will stop and like point things out about what's, what the person's been drawn, drawn go back to writing have you know, more grounded discussion where they're pointing at things and talking about things and editing. Um, and then they'll stand further back. And they'll kind of talk at a higher level about what they're doing. And if they switch pens, so people have been kind of interested in having white, electronic whiteboards where multiple people can write at the same time. We never found in, in studying six teams for six months any situation where the teams were simultaneously writing and in fact, that they didn't even kind of just stand over there and like pass the pen to one another. We found that every time that people switched writing, they actually did it after they were standing way back and talking about things at a higher level before walking in. Um, but then they go kind of back to discussion and start writing again. So there's this kind of dance. Um, and so one of the things that we, we believe, although we don't have from this data, is that what's happening is that people are switching between different modes. They're having grounded discussion. Um, they're doing editing of the stuff that's already been written. They're talking on a high level about whether they're even talking about the right thing, you know, or whether they're heading in the right direction, or whether they're done doing this thing, and maybe they'll stop. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. And so we want a whiteboard that responds to those changes and offers the right tools at those times, and uh, doesn't get bring up other things it doesn't need at the wrong moment of time. This observation that interaction would vary based on the proxemic zones correlates with um, social science research done by Anthony Hall on uh, on human-human interaction, he talks about how people have different proximate zones. He calls them intimate, personal, social, and public. So stand at different distances from people depending on what you're talking about, what kind of relationship you have with them, and what you're working on together. And so we basically took that and mapped that onto this um, design of the interactive whiteboard. We put um, a series of sensors in the front of the board so that we could tell how close and far people were, and then started paying more attention to what people were doing. So at, in this first pass, when we were designing the system, we worked on three things that we were trying to support as features. Um, managing the sessions to tell when people kind of 
have one of these five-minute things, you can segment different uh, the data capture object recognition so that you can actually tell how, like, which things are belong in a list together and which, so when you move them, you want them to move together. Uh, and clustering of ink strokes so that you might tell, for example, what a whole word is instead of just looking at individual <laughs> ink strokes. Um, and one of the things that we were doing is using uh, presentation techniques, like the sort of things that people do with one another, uh, as explained in Goffman, to kind of give off, give off information um, to help communicate what changes were taking place. Here's some information about the platform design. We're using a smart, um, smart board overlay in front of a rear projection SVGA screen. Um, it's running Windows XP. I'd be happy to talk about the details for anyone who's interested in this after. And here's an example of just some of, the, of how this interaction works. This is actually my husband. I asked him to write a Christmas list. Um. <laughs> so one of the things that you can see is that when he's up close in writing, that you just, he's just kind of laying down ink normally. But when he takes a step back, there's it's not totally clear if you can see this in the video. There are these outlines that show what clusters are. And so when he moves, when he moves something, he can actually tell what's going to move together. And if the computer has misclustered it, he can actually anticipate that and fix it. Okay. So this is. I showed you this kind of other technique before for how Dorman interacts. And this is how the, our mapping of this technique that we're using for in clustering. So while you're actually drawing and writing things, it's your inputs and how close the ink strokes are together that um, the system is reacting to that's kind of being done. But the, there's no, at the time that that's happening, we don't actually elevate the, that action to the user's attention. Um, and so it's only when the user steps back that the cluster outlines appear and the user can see the cluster outline. And so if that's fine, if there's nothing wrong with that, then you kind of actually rinse and repeat and kind of go back and forth where you walk in and you step and you do some more writing and then you step back and you can see these cluster outlines. But if there's something wrong, the user has the ability to correct this by circling it and correcting it. So this is a really different model than where um, a situation, for example, where you're clustering the ink stores automatically and automatically providing feedback. Um, or where you're clustering things automatically and you never give feedback and next time someone wants to move things, you, you just move a bunch of things together and the user has no idea what's happening. So I think that what we see here is kind of a successful communication technique for joint action. So um, it's not to say that you couldn't design things other ways, but this way kind of allows this, uh, by designing the interaction this way, you en enable override and kind of um, people's expectations are set up correctly and things should be smoother. Um, we have one of the other things that we do um, between sessions is kind of show images uh, from, that are captured from different whiteboard meetings, these ambient images, basically like a screensaver. But one thing we enable is that if an image that is actually interesting comes up, you can actually grab it and use it for the current whiteboard session. So uh, that, the technique we use for that we call system presentation, um, which is basically how the system shows what it thinks it's doing or what it's doing to the user. So in this case, the range is showing ambient display. And when the user approaches, the transition starts where the images start to move off. Um, and because the images are moving aside in an apparent way and slowly enough, the user is able to cache the image to sketch with. And you know this is different than kind of the way a traditional screensaver works where the images disappear. disappear. So th there's no kind of potential for, you know, like, oh, I didn't want that to go. I actually liked it there. Um, so this is kind of a way that you can have these interactions and create opportunities and affordances without necessarily having to use words or buttons um, to make that happen. So since we did this first round of work with these three features, what we found was that in actual use, when we got people to come in and use it, there wasn't enough going on on the whiteboard that kind of um, necessity, you know, if you just have people say, like, come in and do whatever meeting you're going to do. But you know, when you use the whiteboard, you use the whiteboard. There just wasn't enough activity at the whiteboard that our being implicit or explicit was making enough of a difference. So um, in our second pass at this, we've actually started working closely with Jonathan Edelman and Micah Landy um, at the Center for Design Research. They're working on the problem of how you arrange spaces to um, facilitate collaboration and how different styles of collaboration are facilitated by different arrangements of furniture. 
And so we started to think a little bit more explicitly about how uh, we could build around a scenario where we're really supporting that kind of work. Because in that situation, there's a real clear reason why they're using the whiteboard, uh, things they're trying to do. So in this scenario, um, Micah and, and, and Jonathan are looking at this board. And they draw, first, they draw a plan. And then they um, fill in the plan with kind of pieces of furniture. And you can see it would make sense that they would want the furniture to move around, but not the plan. So the automatic clustering has some purpose there. Um, and you'd also want to be able to reuse the furniture. Um, so we expect them to kind of step in and out and move things around. But later on, when they kind of take a step back and are talking about what's going on and the conversation dies down a little bit, the board can actually kind of present this uh, view, uh, layout hierarchical view of how their discussions have evolved and you know where they've actually kind of generated alternatives, where they've kind of used the same plan and the same furniture but moved them around, um, and where they kind of have progression uh, along the same idea. And that might help people kind of think a little bit about more about whether they want to develop one idea more or which ideas are kind of more promising to so go through and uh, select and weed um, different ideas. And I think that the next go around, we're actually planning to do testing around this scenario. And I think that, uh, first of all, kind of enables us to have more features that are worth making implicit and explicit, um, and also kind of creates a better draw for using the system to kind of give us better information. The final thing, which I'm not going to have that much time to focus on or talk about, um, I'm just going to brush over quickly, is kind of using implicit cues in in-car navigation. So I've done some preliminary work kind of just informally observing people um, and how they give instructions to super, sh uh, super shuttle drivers and people who are giving them rides um, in elder taxi situations. So uh, situations where elderly people get rides from other people and they have to give them instructions on how to get their doctor's office or go to the grocery store that they want to go to. Um, and one of the things that I found is that people are really commonly use um, pre-queuing so that before they give an instruction, they do something and they say like, uh, sometimes they do that explicitly, like saying, I'm going to tell you what to do next. But more often, there's a lot of like wiggling around or shuffling, you know, unnecessary shuffling. And it always comes right before um, an instruction comes. And the, the instructions are usually accompanied by some sort of like physical gesturing. In one really startling and funny situation, one of the women that was getting a ride uh, in this elder taxi I was sitting along with, uh, she actually was blind because she was coming from the eye doctor and had these patches on, but she was still gesturing at the user, you know, at the driver, like which way to turn. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, one of the wonderful things about kind of testing implicit interactions in cars is that there are driving simulators. Um, and so it makes it possible to help quantify what the effect of uh, implicit interactions are, and especially on performance. So that's the main goal of, of this uh, thread of work, how, quantifying how implicit interactions improve people's ability to kind of not only not follow instructions, but also not get in accidents and just stay in the middle of their lanes, kind of here to good driving procedure. Uh, and that's work that's going to happen this summer with Doug Torlo. And so if anyone's interested in that work, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but it's just very early. So so the, that's the work that I'm planning to do for my dissertation. I, I mean, going beyond this basic framework. I think one of the really interesting things is to really think about how you can use this information about how implicit interactions work um, to get beyond toy problems. So I think I really just kind of by proof of concept used the framework that I've developed um, in the design and looked for insights. But one of the things I would really like to do is kind of test this out with other designers and get feedback on what, what of the system makes perfect sense and what is not really helping them understand situations. Um, I also think a kind of interesting and obvious thing to do is to kind of couple this work on interaction design with inference systems. Like, think a little bit about how um, the degree to which kind of well designed implicit interaction can help make up for um, shortcomings in inference systems. And also, like, whether having kind of better or worse inference systems really leads you to having different kinds of interactions um, that work. And finally, I like to kind of design things that actually are used. And I think that the reasons why you want to use implicit interactions the most are situations where you have interactive devices help people do things that they want to do, but maybe just can't do on their own, or just um, inclined to do on their own. Um, one thing you can do is just make everyday devices a little easier to use, because a lot of times there's just features and things that you don't know about and don't know how to use, and they don't communicate their availability to you um, 
statically, or, or they communicate their ability to you through the, you know, a line item on a box or in a user manual. Uh, and thinking about uh, how to use implicit actions to kind of indicate that there are affordances that might be useful um, could make all sorts of things better. It's also interesting to think about things like uh, health maintenance and energy conservation, which are things that people do want to do, but are hard to maintain. It's hard to maintain the motivation to do that all the time. And think a little bit more about how interactive systems can be proactive um, and bring things up when they're to people's attention and uh, hide at the appropriate moment so that people are actually motivated to do, you know, make good on social cha uh, behavioral change. So that's kind of where I think this work is going, where I think it has the most promise. I'd like to bring this back uh, to this tree. So I, I mentioned at the beginning, the stuff that I'm doing is out kind of out here in the leaves. We're looking at the applications of ubiquitous computing. What can you do with all these chips and sensors and things like that? What I've tried to do is look a little bit about what are the features of what these systems offer and how does that change the way that you might design it? And I'm actually hoping to get to the point that they, there's kind of a practice where you look for analogous patterns and situations that work when you're designing situations. And that basically brings the work a little bit further down the branch to kind of common um, practices and solutions that don't just apply to people who are solving the same problem you're solving, but that you know, widens the class of uh, problems and solutions where you can share something with one another. Uh, and this is really driving to kind of thinking about how design practice is going to change a little bit when we start to have more interactive technologies. I mean, I think these core basics, like are you going to need to stop doing need finding? Are you going to stop sketching? I think will not change. But I think uh, further down, like, that there's going to be some real differences in the way that we pursue design practice if it's really based in kind of having social knowledge of, about how people behave. If that's something that's important for designers to know about, I think that they're inclined to do it. Um, so. I'd like to say thanks. Um, this work is clearly interdisciplinary. I've gotten help from people in many departments. Um, uh, I've also collaborated with a great number of people and, um, who have a lot of talents beyond those of my own. And the only th reason that we're able to pull these things together. And um, I really like to thank the Intel Foundation for sponsoring this research because it's not the sort of thing that normally gets sponsored in the academic setting. So I have one. I'm, I'm curious when it's reasonable to use the term joint action. So if I were to write a word in my notebook with my pen, I, it would seem more likely that I would describe it as tool use rather than joint action. Although, depending on how you count things, it could certainly be joint action between me and my pen. And, and whereas if when we're having a conversation that there, there, there's certainly a whole lot of joint action going on, and we would use that to describe human-human communication in a way that we wouldn't to describe human-tool communication. I'm curious, where, where, at what point does it become reasonable to describe things in that way? Um, I think that the point at which you start to look at something like joint action is when you see something like behavior. And I've started to define behavior as what happens depends on something, you know, like, so uh, to the degree that our tools are are fairly static and, and their behavior doesn't depend, you know, um, then they behave like more like static tools. Um, but it, I think um, when your pen runs out of ink, for example, I think there's a moment where you have something that's a little like <laughs> a conversation where you're like, are you really at, I mean, like, is this, what is going on? You know, so you basically, uh, Terry's more perspective, you have a breakdown. And you basically try to understand, like, well, my intent was to put an ink line down. I hadn't even thought about it very clearly. Definitely, in this situation, the pen is like an extension of myself. But when it stops producing ink, you look at the pen, and you think, like, did I hold it wrong? Do I just need to shake it a little? And then there's kind of this negotiation of what's going on, and what is this pen going to do for me? And it becomes more like joint action. I think that part of what um, we're reaching with these interact te uh, re interactive technologies is the realization that um, where you feel uh, felt about affordances, which were like kind of these static things. I mean, you know, the model there is basically of a tool. And um, um, our ways of understanding dynamic things, like other people, are actually part of a continuum and not just like these wholly separate things. So when you start to think about something like what an interactive affordance looks like, so how something like a pen suggests that it can do a few things that a normal pen can't do, um, 
you know it's not going to have this conversation with you about the stock market or politics, but there, there's something more than like what like a static tool would do. And so uh, I think we start to kind of inch up towards conversation. So uh, I think what we're starting to look at is there's some spectrum where we didn't see a spectrum before. Yeah. When you were on the way earlier slides and you were showing the, the, uh, the door and the coffee cup and the yeah. people back and forth, it occurred to me that one of the dimensions that might be useful is that with the door example, the person leaving the door partway open or closing it completely or whatever is not intent on interacting with, with a particular individual, where in the other examples they were, mm -hmm. which is not quite the same thing as, as the proactive. Uh, reactive thing or I mean it's a little bit of a different dimension and it occurs to me that that maybe and maybe you, I, I don't know what your perspective on this but that maybe that would be uh, manifest itself like in your, with the automated door the difference between a door that opens or resonates its motors which is more individual well at least open is more uh, on the individual level uh -huh. where or just like a, a green light on the near the door handle or something that's more of the general, but that might be more analogous to, to the person who uses the door partly open. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that for most of the examples I've picked, there's, it's a, I'm really looking at just dyadic relationship. There's just two actors, right? I, and I've just done that for simplicity's sake. There's just like not a statement about the world or what's desirable, but uh, desire to finish my PhD sooner rather than later, right? Um, <laughs> But I think that what you're looking at is that in, in, in the case of the door, um, you know, the, the, the door, office door example, um, who you're sending things to is not clear. And in fact, you're sending, it's actually a one-to-many situation. Everyone who walks by sees it, and it, it's not directed at you um, if it's directed at all, right? So if the user, if the sender is aware, then they're not aware of who the receiver is going to be, you know, um, and they might not even be aware. Um, but I think that actually fits into Goffman's model of kind of presentation of self in everyday life. That you don't think really hard about all the people you're going to see during the course of the day. You might think about one or two people, but you have, you dress a certain way and you know that it's going to give off, you know, certain signals about you and that people are going to read certain kinds of meaning into that. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not the sort of targeted communication that you have, you know, with one, a one-on-one -on -one, face to face. Thing. And does that have an, inter or an impact on? Uh, automation techniques or? Um, I think that it's a little bit, I think that's basically a context thing, like for automation techniques where um, you're trying to signal things to a group of people, um, that's that's sort of an issue, but I really haven't gotten into into deeper into that. Yes? Yeah, I'm interested in a uh, door interaction. Uh, so uh, in your design, a person can come by and the door can open directly. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested, uh, is it, uh, does it need a specific uh, sensor above the door to recognize a person is coming? Something? Um, well, in our experiments for faking it, I think that you could accomplish what you need to with a web camera and a proximity sensor. You know, in the uh, transistor uh, cafeteria, there's also some, ca uh, some cameras hanging over the uh, doors. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious, is it also an um, interaction uh, an implicit in interaction. I'll tell you what the interesting implicit interaction thing is around kind of most automatic doors. So the old technology they used to use actually used uh, load cells or really uh, capacitive mats in front of doors. Um, and part of the thing that you got from that wasn't just the sensor that enabled, the, you know, the door to understand they were standing standing in front of them, but also there was. A, a signal to someone that this was an automatic door, and that's the doormat, and if I stand there, this is what's going to happen. So uh, this is that example of a system presentation. The system is presenting this affordance and offer, you know, the potential for offer. And the problem with the optical sensors is they don't, they don't have that in, sort of inherent in their design. And so what you often see is the old mat connected to nothing with an optical sensor over it, right? Um, it's, it's vestigial. But it's vestigial not because people just forgot to take it away, but because it has this func secondary function beyond this triggering this door, which is communicating to a user that this is an automatic door and here's where you stand. Um, and that when we design these systems like optical sensors, we often forget to design these things in because we don't, because they're not inherently necessary and we don't think explicitly about the need to signal to users when we design these interactive technologies.
Thank you very much. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.